Amen. For the last four weeks, I've been talking about becoming His dwelling place. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 to 22, I'm going to read that again. It says, Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Now what we've done is we've gone back and looked at the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle that Solomon built. And we saw that those are types and shadows of the tabernacle that the Lord is building today, which is made up of living stones. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 calls us living stones. 1 Timothy 3.15 says the church is to be the house of God. So the tabernacle God's building today is not made of uh, wood or brick. It's made of human beings who've given their heart to Christ. And he tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that God is in process of building us together into a holy habitation. Holy, H-O-L-Y. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 3, God told Moses, I must be regarded as holy by those who draw near me. Some would say that's the Old Testament. But Malachi, God says, I am the Lord and I change not. Amen. And Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We've emphasized and we should emphasize the grace of God, but we sometimes it gets emphasized the grace of God to the exclusion of the holiness of God. See, we're still called to be holy. First Peter chapter 1, verse 15 and 16 says, Be holy in all your conduct, for it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. That's New Testament. That's New Testament. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 it says, pursue holiness. That means it's not automatic. Go after it. It said, pursue peace with all men and holiness. Without it, no one will see the Lord. So in the Old Testament, the, the temple was built and they had to wash before they could go in. They had to get sanctified. When they obeyed that, and they washed before they came together, the glory of God came. So we've been talking about for the last few weeks. And so I want to go a little farther today <clears throat> along those lines. And I want to first talk to us a little bit more about what the Bible calls types and shadows. That phrase types and shadows comes from Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, depending on what translation you have. But it says that the Old Testament priest, when they served... Their service, the altar, the temple, the sacrifices, were some translations use the word type or a pattern or an example of the spiritual reality of the heavenlies. That's what Hebrews 8, 5 says. So we're told that the Old Testament, what happened in the Old Testament, God uh, has it written for us on purpose because there are shadows and types and patterns and examples for us who are in the New Testament. You understand that? For example, when Peter calls us living stones, where does he get that? Well, he's using the types and shadows. From the Old Testament, stones were built to build the altar of God. But he said, we're living stones. So God calls us a house. Well, it's a picture. It's a word picture. So I'm saying this to, to uh, lay a foundation because we're going to go back and look at some types and shadows and find out revelation for us in the New Testament. You see, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Now, when he wrote all scripture, they didn't have the canon of the New Testament. 
He's writing to New Testament believers, telling them all the Old Testament and the New, all Scripture, is given by the inspiration of God. And for us New Testament believers, the Old Testament, that's what was the canon they had when he wrote this. When he said all Scripture, they had the Old Testament. Is profitable. The Old Testament is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You see, when Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he expounded to them about himself from the Old Testament, from the Psalms and the prophets. He, he pulled out the types and shadows. Jesus used types and shadows when he taught. He said, just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the earth for three days. So there are all kinds of mysteries hidden in the Old Testament. That when the Holy Spirit opens our eyes, we can see the New Testament in the Old Testament concealed. And the Old Testament is in the New revealed. Now we have the book of Hebrews, and we can read the Hebrews now and look back at the Old Testament and say, that's what it meant. That's why they burned bulls and goats. Oh, that's what it means. Now we know. So it's important for us. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, Paul writes, Brethren, I don't want you to be unaware of all that our fathers were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea, speaking about the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. You see, they didn't know the rock was Christ. But they drank from him. Christ was in the Old Testament concealed. He's in the New revealed. But with most of them, verse 5, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Verse 6, now these things became our example. Their bodies being scattered in the wilderness became an example for us to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They said, we want to go back to Egypt. We want the leeks and the onions. We want meat. We don't want this heavenly food that you've rained down. This perfect manna from heaven, we don't want that. We want what the world has. God, anyway, it's terrible. He it says, and we should not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. That was their idolatry, eating, drinking, recreation, and sexual immorality. It says, nor, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted. See, they were tempting Christ. He was with them. He's the same. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As some of them also tempted him, and they were destroyed by serpents. Nor let us complain, as some of them also complained, and they were destroyed by the destroyer. Verse 11, here's what I'm getting to. All these things happened to them as examples and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So everything written in the Old Testament was written as an example, instruction, admonition for us. That's what I'm trying to say. And by the way, an example is also translated a pattern. Another definition is a punishment inflicted on someone as a warning to others. I'm reading from Webster. Or one that is representative of all of a group or type. Example. So, we are told what happened to them could happen to us. Now, there's many people, there's popular teachings today that says there's no more judgment today. All judgment happened at the cross. The only way someone can believe that is if they don't read the entire New Testament carefully. Read Hebrews. New Testament, book of Hebrews, chapter 13. God says, the fornicator and the adulterer, I will judge. Read Galatians. If you sow to the, it says, Galatians chapter 6, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. 
Read the letter to the seven churches of Jesus speaking to the seven churches. He began to all seven churches by saying, I know your works. I know your love, your devotion. I also know where you're falling short. Read it. And he says, I am he. All the churches should know that I am he who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will give to everyone according to their works. He said, I, I gave Jezebel time to repent of her sexual immorality, but she didn't. I'm going to cast her on a sick bed, and I will kill her children. That's New Testament. But what happens is, God, see, God doesn't like to judge. He doesn't like to. Judgment is his last straw. God is so patient. He's so kind. He's so long-suffering. He doesn't like to judge. But judgment happens when we persist in, un, uh, in disobedience and unbelief. It can happen. It's his last straw. Judgment is the redemptive judgments are God's last straw to get us into salvation before we have eternal judgment. See, though, everything God does, even his judgments, are, are done out of love. But the, the deception comes is we misinterpret God's patience for license. Someone could be a fornicator for 10 years and feel like they're getting away with it. And then they hear a doctor, no, there's no judgment today. Then they can buy into it and keep doing it. Then they can end up in hell. Don't mistake God's patience for his approval. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11 says, Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. See, they thought, oh, God hasn't judged me. I've done this. Nothing bad's happened. Been doing it for this long. I'm okay. Don't mistake God's patience for his approval. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's holy. It's the truth. Anyway, that's not my point. My point was types and shadows. That was a little rabbit trail. God says in Malachi 3, 6, I am the Lord. I do not change. So what I'm trying to do is lay a foundation for understanding the intended revelation that we are supposed to receive from the Old Testament. Specifically, the building of the temples, where there's types and shadows in the Old Testament of the spiritual reality of Ephesians chapter 2, that you are to be built together into a holy dwelling place. So if we go back and see how they were built, the process of what happened, then we can understand what God wants to do in us to build a holy habitation right here for His glory. Amen? I want to, and I, again, I mentioned Moses' tabernacle and Solomon's temple that we talked about the last four weeks, where the priests would sanctify themselves. That means they would intentionally cleanse themselves before they gathered together, and when they did, the glory would manifest. Now, sanctification, just to uh, clarify for some of us, some of us love God, we live a clean life, but sanctification goes beyond living a clean life. See, I'm not doing any conscious, willful sins that I know of. Sanctification means tuning in to the Lord. And that comes from, the only way that comes is from spending focused time with Him. Time where our heart is focused on Him, focused on His Word. When we do that, sanctification, that means our affections, our thoughts are not given to other things. They're now focused on the Lord. The sanctification is something that we practice and we should practice daily and, and even become a lifestyle where we get better and better at it as we learn to go through the day carrying the Lord's presence, our consciousness of Him with us, the focus of our heart being to always be in His will, to always please Him. But again, we have duties, we have kids to raise, jobs to work, things to do. And um, so we need special times where we can pull away from that. It's vital. It's vital if we're going to bear fruit. Jesus said, unless you abide in me, you can't bear fruit. So sanctifying ourselves means coming aside. Coming aside. Intentionally. 
separating ourselves from media and noise. Get alone with the Lord. Quiet our hearts. Begin to thank the Lord. We enter His gates with thanksgiving. That's the beginning place. Start with thanking the Lord. You say, I don't know how to spend a, a quality prayer time. Thank the Lord from the bottom of your heart. If you're stuck, ask the Holy Spirit. I do this regularly. I ask the Holy Spirit for help regularly. That's why He's given to us. He's our helper. Say, Holy Spirit, you can tell Him. Holy Spirit, my heart feels... My heart feels it like it's in neutral right now. It feels sterile. My heart's cold. Help me. I'm distracted. Help me, Holy Spirit. Help me to thank God. He will. And as you start thanking Him, Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You start to come into His presence. And then repent of sin. Because as you come into his presence, you'll start to be convicted. It's amazing how we're not convicted sometimes. Until we draw aside, get into his presence, start the, and then ooh, we start getting convicted. Why? Because we've been detached from his presence. You get convicted, you repent. Keep thanking him. Read his word. Pray his word. Meditate on his word. Hold his word in your heart. Have some intentional, deliberate time daily where your heart is focused on the Lord. Where you're intentionally reminding yourself. This is what I do to myself. I remind myself intentionally, Joe, the first commandment is to love God with all your heart. So I just bring myself back and say, Lord, Lord, I love you with all my heart. And if I'm not, help me to love you with all my heart. The second commandment is love my neighbor as myself. And I, that's what sanctification is. I just say, Lord, help me to love everybody. Help me, Lord. And I repent of the times I haven't. What am I doing? I'm sanctifying my heart. Have I said something? Have I thought something? Have I done something? Have I, Lord, I repent of it. I, go, I, I choose love. Lord, I, I, want, I don't want to go through the day thinking about me, me, me. I want to go through the day thinking, listen, we were created to give God pleasure. We were created for His pleasure. We were made by design to love Him. That's how He made us. So we're to go through the day thinking, what would please God? What would please God? And when I have those kind of thoughts, my heart is being sanctified. I mean, I'm taking my divided thoughts, my divided affections, and I'm honing them in, focusing on the Lord. Then I go through my day, then I carry that through my day, and through the day I may be distracted many times, but then I, and, and then I bring my heart back to the Lord. So they would sanctify themselves before they came together. Sanctifying our Heart, sanctifying our focus, spending time in the Word sanctifies us. As I explained a few weeks ago, when we begin to sing songs, we become sanctified. Sanctified means our heart, our, our affections are on the Lord. See, we come in, we may have a million things. Oh, it's Christmas shopping, or did I spend too much on Black Friday, or whatever we're thinking, or I'm going to go to the memorial service. How's Linda's family? We may have all these thoughts, but when we start to do this, our thoughts become sanctified. Sanctified means set apart exclusively for Him. That's what it means, sanctified. That's what holy means. Holy means I'm set apart exclusively for Him. So only when the believers would sanctify themselves would the glory come. That's why when we gather... Unless we've been practicing this throughout the week and we do it before we come. If we all spend time with the Lord on Sunday morning before we come in, time alone in your closet, time alone on your knees, time. Sometimes we need time to repent. 
We need time to confess some things and plead the blood of Jesus. We need time to uh, commune with the Lord and say, Lord, show me how am I going to love my children better, or my spouse better? How am I going to be a better pastor? And, the, and while your prayer, ideas will come to you. Thoughts will come to you. That's communing with God. When you do that and for a while, for a good chunk of time, then you're, you have a buoyancy in your spirit. A spring in your step, a sparkle in your eye. There's a crackle. You feel God. You feel His peace. That means you're now a lamp that's not empty. There's oil in it. So you're not a lamp coming to church trying to suck the oil from the worship team. You're a lamp with oil adding your light to the inferno. And this is something that has to change. Because the consumer mentality has been how the Western church has been all of our lives. We design, I'm, I'm speaking in generalities now, churches are designed to attract people. Don't do the worship too long because some people won't like it and they won't come back next week. And if they don't come back, that means you won't get their tithe. So we should shorten it up because we love money. And we want a big church. Doesn't matter if the people are lukewarm as long as we have a big church. See, that's it's consumerism is what we've been raised on. To make the service appealing for people, comfortable, make them feel blessed, entertained, whatever. And that needs to change. We need to break that. We're not consumers. We're not coming to buy anything. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We belong to our Father. Our Savior Jesus redeemed us. We're, now there's what they called in the Old Testament. They called it the tabernacle of meeting. They knew they were going to meet God. They knew God would manifest. So they washed before they went. They said, we're going to wash. They knew what would happen if they didn't wash. They were in danger of being judged. Read about the sons of the priests that brought... They brought the wrong fire. False fire. The fire from heaven came down and killed them. That's why the glory's not here. I'm not kidding. I'm very, very serious. God's presence isn't stronger than it is when we gather because we are not sanctifying ourselves more. You see, we, and that's not a shame, I'm not scolding people, I'm not rebuking anybody, I'm just saying what is. You see, when you, if you pictured a, a dark garage, you know our garage is, well, some people, like I can imagine, I just looked over at Joe, and I, I could imagine Joe's garage is so neat because I know Joe and Tina. Everything's probably immaculate. I bet their floor is painted. Is it? Okay. All right, okay, they have a teenager. Okay. <laughs> well, he's not a teenager anymore. Some people's garages are like that. Very neat. They got cabinets, painted floors. No, but most people's garages aren't like that. Am I talking to most people today? I mean, it's, it's where the stuff, just put stuff in there. Most people don't even park their cars in there. They can't get their car in. All their junk is in there. Now, now, suppose there's no light in the garage, okay? No light in the garage. And you can, you can straighten it up. You can push stuff in the corners. You can put piles in there, and you can make it look straight but it's not really clean. And then you, let's say you don't have a, a light bulb. Let's say all you have is a, one of those little teeny tiny, like the Christmas lights, little night light. And you turn it on in there. 
you can't really see. You can see, but not very well. You might say, oh, this needs to be straightened up here. There, there. now it looks clean. It looks nice. All right, let's graduate to a 40-watt bulb. You put a 40-watt bulb in there, you go, oh, my goodness, what a mess over there. So you clean it up a little bit more. So now it looks straight. All right, let's put in two 100-watt bulbs. You put in two 100-watt bulbs, you go, oh, my gosh, it's a, it's a pig pen. But see, back with the little bulb, we thought, no, it's straightened up. I got it looking good. Because why did it look good? Because of the lack of light. Psalm 119, verse 130 says, The entrance of his word brings light. 1 John 1, 5 says, God is light. Psalm 36 says, In his light we see light. So what happens is when we're far away from the scripture, we're not holding it in our heart. God said in Leviticus, is it, or Deuteronomy, chapter three, 10, verse 3, I must be regarded as holy by those who come near me. We could say, if we're not in the Word very much, we're not in prayer very much, we can sincerely say, I am, I'm, I got it, I'm just cleaned up. Let's turn the light on. A little more. You got two, now you got 200 watt lights and you see it's a real mess. So you clean it up, and now you got to get the vacuum out and the dustpan and, the, and, cl and clean up everything. There's a paint spill over there. Say, okay, it looks pretty good now. All right, let's see how good it looks. Let's open the garage door. And now the sunlight's coming in. Say, well, you know what? It needs to be cleaned some more. That's, that's a picture of sanctification. Listen, the more time we put this word in our heart, the brighter the light gets. That's, how, that's what Jesus said in John 17, 17. He said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says that Christ gave himself for the church. He loved the church. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might wash her with water by the word. So for me to neglect the word is to deny Jesus the purpose for which he died for me. He died, he washed me with his blood so that he could wash me with his word. So if we love God, we give ourselves to the word. In the words, if we love and we spend the time sanctifying our hearts in the word. If we love him. Jesus said in John 14, 21, whoever keeps my word is the one that loves me. John the Beloved writes in 1 John chapter 5, he said, this is the love of God, that we keep his commands, and his commandments are not burdensome. So the entrance of his word brings light. It sanctifies us. So when we make it an intentional goal during the week to be in the word, to be praying the word, to be pursuing holiness, I want to, have, I want to pursue clean hands, pure heart, in lips that are free from guile, lips that don't curse but speak grace. The Bible says, Proverbs 22, 11, whoever loves a pure heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. I want the king to be my friend. Don't you? Yeah. Then I have to get my lips under control. We need to tame the tongue. And the way we do that is by meditating on the word. So we don't say things unless they're graceful. We don't say things unless they're merciful, true, kind, of good report. That's sanctification. And to the degree we practice that is the degree the glory of God comes. God wants to dwell in our midst more than we want Him to come. Because when He, His, His purpose for sanctuary, His purpose for habitation is to touch the nations. We'll see that. Anyway, uh, let me go on with... Uh, sharing with you a prophetic dream. I had a couple of them this last week. But in one dream, it was very encouraging to me. The first part of the dream was discouraging, and then God encouraged me. In the dream, I was up here, and I was saying things in the dream that, I, that shocked me because they're not things that I would think of. 
I have, I have not for quite a while read the book of Zechariah. I haven't been thinking about it. I haven't in any way thought about it or connected it to what I've been preaching the last four weeks, although it is very much connected. I haven't thought about it. So in my dream, I'm standing up here to this pretty full sanctuary. I'm assuming it was a Sunday morning. But in the dream, I was under a strong anointing. I mean, my bones were burning with fire. Like Jeremiah said, your word is like fire shut up in my bones. That's how it was. And it was coming out of me like a volcano. And I was preaching. Now, I can't, I can't redo it like I saw it in the dream, but I'll just tell you what I said. Under the strong anointing, as I was preaching, I was saying something like this. The same sovereign God who sovereignly called Zechariah and had a divine purpose and a divine plan and a divine destiny for Zechariah in Zechariah's day, that same call from the God that called Zechariah is upon you for this day for God's divine purpose and God's divine plan now. So I was saying that, oh, and then when I said it, I looked out and don't take this personal, but most of the people didn't get it. It was just like there was a fog, like, huh? And then I looked again and I saw a couple people in the back that were getting it. And then the service was over. And for some reason, I walked out. I never go out the back door. I walked out the back door. And in my heart, I was telling myself, I can't take this. I can't take it. I just preach the word of the Lord, and they're not getting it. I can't take it. And I, I told myself, I'm not going back to church. Now listen, until Thursday. I knew Thursday was the next service. <laughs> That's what I said. In the dream, I said, I'm not going back until Thursday. And for some reason, Thursdays are a praise night and I'm teaching. But for some reason in the dream, Thursday was going to be a prayer meeting. Okay? I said, I walked out and actually Chris Sterling was with me. He was walking with me. He's like, Pastor, I hear you. I'm with you. And, and we walked out and, uh, and uh, I said, I'm not going back to church till Thursday. I can't do it. I can't take it. So, you know, in a dream, like three seconds later is Thursday. And so I'm, I walked back in, and it was about 15 minutes before church. And, you know, as prayer meetings usually uh, bring small turnouts. I'm expecting a small group here. But I walk in, and there's two or three times the number of people as normal. And I said to somebody, I said, what are all these people doing here for prayer? Do they know it's a prayer meeting? And uh, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, wow. And then, I, then people just kept pouring in, pouring in. And it wasn't time for church yet, so I walked in the office. When I walked in the office, there were some people in there. I said, do you believe it? What's going on? I said, there must be revival. God's working in the hearts of people. They're all coming out. And uh, then someone else said, they're hungry. They're hungry. They're hungry for the word of God. And then I, then I woke up from that dream. And what I was excited because in the dream, it's, it's funny, unless you've had a dream like this, in the dream I knew I was dreaming, and when I heard myself say about the call of Zechariah on our church, I was even excited in the dream. I thought, I can't wait to wake up and look it up. I said, there's something awesome prophetic in this. I can't wait to get to it. Because I haven't read the book of Zechariah in a while. I want to go back and reread it. And what is God telling me? Because see, in the natural, I never would have said that. That was a word of the Lord. And then the, the, what I was feeling like, ah, oh, they're not getting it. A moment later, God said, yeah, it's not by you. It's me. I'm building the church. See, God started working in the hearts of people. But anyway, let me just say this. I want to give you a summary now, a little summary of the book of Zechariah, and see if we can... That's why I laid the foundation of the shadows and types, 
See, if we can extract some things that God would be saying to us to build the habitation of God. From Zechariah. First, I'd like to read a little summary. I pulled this off the internet. Internet, it's by a man named, uh, a person named Jay Smith. The book of Zechariah is a post-exilic book. That means it was written after the return from captivity of their exile in Babylon. The prophet Zechariah wrote chapters 1 through 8, approximately 520 to 518 B.C., before the temple was completed. And then he wrote chapters 9 through 14, approximately 480 B.C., after the temple was completed. The purpose, listen to this, the purpose of the book that Zechariah wrote was to encourage the remnant. You are a remnant. Listen, most of the body of Christ doesn't have the understanding of the habitation of the glory of God that it's supposed to be our inheritance. Most of the body doesn't. Most of the body doesn't care. If we go to a meeting and there's some prophecies and a few healings, that will be thrilling enough for most of the body. And thank God for the gifts. I love and cherish all the gifts. But that's different than habitation. Habitation is where you can't stand because of the glory of God. Habitation is where the whole city gathers at the door because Jesus is in the house, Mark 1.33. Habitation is what Bobby Connor prophesied. He said, I'll tell you what's going to happen in this place, Mark chapter 2. It'll be noised abroad that Jesus is in this house. There won't be enough room to get the people in. That's habitation. They're not coming to hear a singer or a preacher. They're coming because they know God is in there. They're not coming because there's some anointed vessels. They're coming because the king is there. And by the way, I had a dream the next day showing me more of what would happen afterwards. Lord God, when my, in my initial discouragement, God showed me in the next moment I came back, the Holy Spirit was sovereignly moving on living stones building His house. Amen. Zechariah was written to encourage the remnant who had recently returned from their exile in Babylon, which is the world's system. Their faith in God was weak. They were not motivated to build the temple. They needed to learn and conform to the law or the ways of God again. That's a summary written by J. Smith on the book of Zechariah. Now, here's the theme that's recurrent through the book of Zechariah, why, why it blessed me so much, because for four weeks, the Lord's had me speak about becoming His habitation. That means preparing our hearts in faith, in obedience, in expectancy for an invasion of God's manifest presence like none of us have ever seen in our lifetime. That is the will of God. I had, a, I had a personal visitation from Jesus Christ regarding this. On March 10th, 1986. It is my life calling. To prophesy. To pray. To teach. Prepare. For whoever will listen. A people that will be built and hunger, and agree, and say, yes, we want habitation. And when they do, the city will be taken. So I was very encouraged when I went and read through the book of Zechariah, and it's all about God building His dwelling place in their midst. I'll just do a very quick summary. Chapter 1, verse 3, begins with God saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord, and I will return to you. That's what we covered the last two weeks, James 4, 8. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. That's God's first call. As he's calling them to, he's calling them to build a, a sanctuary, he said, return to me, that's your heart, and I will return to you. Most of the church doesn't even know he's gone. I don't mean he's gone from, we're born again, Christ is in us, we worship him, there's some, we can sense his presence, 
That's different than the fullness of God. Now, when he said he was speaking to the remnant that came out of Babylon, the reason it was difficult for Zechariah to prophesy and exhort them to build the temple is because none of them, or most of them, except a few people who were very old, had to be in their 90s. Would have been alive when the temple was before the exile. They would have seen the glory of the temple. They would have seen the glory of God come in. But almost everybody else had never seen the temple. The temple structure itself was glorious. They'd never seen it. They'd never seen the glory cloud come in. Where had they been? They'd been carried away exiled into Babylon. That speaks of the world. That's where the church has been. Not everybody. I'm not saying everybody has. But a lot of us have been carried away into the world's thinking, the world's systems, the world's ways. And the world's way of doing church is design a one-hour service on Sunday that everybody likes, so they'll come back for one hour next week. That is not the gospel. The gospel calls men and women to take up their cross and follow Jesus. That's what it is. And they become the dwelling place of the manifested glory of God. That's what they had in the book of Acts. When they gathered for a prayer meeting, the whole place shook. Why? They had a degree of God's presence we don't have. But we're not even aware because we've never seen it in our lifetime. The old timers, you read about uh, William Seymour and some of the old timers who had the glory come in. We shout glory now. They shouted it from the floor, afraid to lift their heads. Yes, they did. When the glory came in, William Seymour, they would all hit the floor, afraid to look up, and they'd all shout, Glory! Glory! We don't know what that is. And anybody coming in, they would be healed. They would have organs replaced, limbs replaced, blind eyes open. They'd walk into it and be filled with the Holy Spirit, fire speaking in tongues. And many of the tongues were known languages of other nations. They'd get on ships and go to other nations, speaking in tongues. But see, in the day of Zechariah, the people didn't know. They had no idea. They weren't motivated. They never saw the temple. They never saw the glory. Build the temple? Ah, it's more work. Where? Why? What's going on? Here's what God said. Return to me and I'll return to you. Verse 16, therefore, thus says the Lord, I'm returning to Jerusalem with mercy. Listen, it's Zechariah, the book of Zechariah. My house shall be built. A surveyor's line shall be stretched out. Thus says the Lord, my city shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord again will comfort Zion. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, God's saying, so God's saying, return to me. Chapter 1, return to me. I will return to you. He said, return to me. He said, my house will be built. My house, my dwelling place will be built. Chapter 2, verse 5, God says, I will be a wall of fire around her, and I will be the glory in her midst. He's trying to tell her, I'll be, I will literally be a wall of fire around you. I'll be glory in your midst. He's telling them, why is he saying that? So that they will build. Then verse 10 of chapter 2, he says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I'm coming. I will dwell in your midst, says the Lord. Now what will happen when he dwells in your midst? Many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and they'll become my people. I will dwell in your midst. The next day after my dream about the calling of Zechariah on our church, then I had an, another dream, and I was back in here, and a place was packed. We had a much bigger building. It was packed. And there was an apostolic team up here of five or six people. I don't know who they were, but I knew this. I knew they were golden, trustworthy, mature, solid people, like people that you feel real good about having a minister. I don't know who they were, but they were ministering up here about five or six people, places packed. And I remember I walked in. It's, it was like the conference atmosphere, people everywhere. 
And I went in the office and ministers from other nations were coming in here. They said, can we come in? We came to see. Can we get prayer? Can someone prophesy to us? That was a dream I had the next night. What does that mean? God said, I will build my house and many nations shall come. He said, I'll dwell in your midst. Chapter 3 is when Joshua the high priest is cleansed from his iniquity and given new garments. Chapter 4, that's the cleansing the Lord brings to the church. Chapter 4, and he answered and said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Now he's, God's still wooing them, calling them, exhorting them, Will you build my house? Will you pay the price? Will you get the material? In other words, for us, it translates, will you make Jesus your first love? Not your job. Not your family. Not your kids. Kids are, raising kids is an awesome high calling. Loving God supremely makes us better at it. If we make that higher than loving God, we're not as good at it as we are when we love God first. If whatever our job is, plumber, doctor, realtor, that is not your identity. Your identity is a son or a daughter of God. You're a living stone. You're being built together into the habitation of God. Seek first the kingdom and His righteousness. Well, you, that's your identity. And you're a realtor or a doctor or a plumber on the side. That's, that's what it means to put the kingdom first. As far as the priorities of our heart. Doesn't mean I don't, still don't work 40 or 50 hours. It means the priorities of my heart. My life goal is not my career. It's not this. It's not that. It's Jesus. So God says, it's not by might or power, it's by my spirit. So he's encouraging them. Verse 7 of chapter 4. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. Zerubbabel was the one leading the construction. Okay? It says, so God is telling them, if the construction of the temple seems difficult to you, God says, I want to tell you, it's not by might or power, it's by my spirit. If you'll do your part, God said, I'll build it. We do our part, God will build it. We obey, God will build it. We believe, God will build it. God said, it's not by might or power, it's by my spirit. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. But he needs our cooperation. How's it? And he said, you shall bring forth the capstone. That's the finishing touch. How? With shouts of grace, grace. So when, we're, when it's hard and we say, this is difficult, can I... Here's what we need to do. We need to refocus on Jesus and say, Grace! Grace! The grace of God will do it. The grace of God will strengthen me. The grace of God will empower me. Grace will finish the building. Grace! 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 And the mountain shall become a plain. He said, The hands of Zerubbabel that have laid the foundation, his hands shall also finish it. Now watch this. Verse 10 of chapter 4. Who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Who are the seven? It says, they are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. You see that again in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6. It said, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So Zerubbabel was building, he had a plumb line, and he's just starting out a monumental task and a build, rebuild the temple. And God says, don't despise the day of small beginnings because the seven eyes of the Lord are rejoicing to see the plumb line in your hand. That's what, that's what God's saying. Whatever level we're at, and we're, we're, we're praying, we're believing, we, we're, we're practicing, we say, okay, during the week, I'm going to cut this out and lay that down. I want to have a little more time to sanctify my heart. 
every day this week. I'm going to make it a lifestyle. I want to really go after purity. I want to go after presence. That's sanctifying our hearts. Now, Zerubbabel had the plumb line. What's a plumb line? A plumb line is a, a, like a string with a weight on the bottom that's held up to use so you get a, a perfectly straight line. So when you're making a building, you can make sure that the walls are square. So it, without a plumb line, we can build walls that look right to us, but we don't have a standard to measure it against. Then you, if you, if you don't use a plumb line and you build a wall and then you put the plumb line up, the wall's crooked. You've got to tear it down and redo it. So a plumb line is the standard by which we build. Believe it or not, what I'm doing is exactly what Zerubbabel was doing. By preaching the word to you, I'm holding up the plumb line. I'm saying this is the standard. This is the line. This is what should be built. By the way, this is very interesting. I discovered that the building of the temple started in the first year of Cyrus. The first year of Cyrus's reign, the temple started to be built. Now listen, the prophets, Lance Wall now, Brother Sedu, and others all received revelation that Donald Trump would be a Cyrus. And do you remember Paul Dennecutton's prophecy? We prayed it. He said, when his office term begins, all the prayers that we prayed for our nation will be answered during that term. It's time for the house of the Lord to be built. It's time for the house of the Lord to be built. But God says, don't despise the, the efforts that we make during the week to sanctify God in our heart to walk closer to the Lord, to walk cleaner, to walk purer, to have more love. That's what purity is. It means to love more. It means to care more. It means to be clean. Clean hands, pure hearts. That's chapter 4. Chapter 6. Then he said, the Lord of hosts says, Behold the man whose name is the branch. From his place he shall branch out. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Of course, it was speaking about Joshua, who they called the branch, but it's a prophecy about Jesus. Again, the exhortation, God said, it says in chapter 6, He shall build the temple, he shall bear the glory. Chapter 7, God told Zechariah why he scattered their fathers who disobeyed. In verse 8, it says, The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. Show mercy, compassion, love your brother, help the poor. That sounds a little bit like the parallel to Ephesians chapter 4. Where in chapter, one, chapter 2 he said you're to be his dwelling place. And in chapter 4 he said in order to walk worthy of that calling, he said... Bear with one another with long suffering, gentleness, patience, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So he said, I said this to your fathers, but they did not obey. They shirked the word of God. So God said, In my anger, I scattered them. That's what chapter 7 says. So he said, Don't be like them. Then chapter 8, the word of the Lord comes again to encourage them. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great zeal. With great fervor I'm jealous for her, says the Lord. I will return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. We're told in the book of Hebrews that we, the church, have come to Zion. Wherever true believers gather, hungry for the presence, habitation of the Lord, is Zion. That's Zion. In the New Testament, where true believers gather for the presence of the Lord, that is Zion. God said, I'm zealous for Zion with great... That's what Hebrews tells us. We have come to Zion. And God said, I'm zealous for Zion with great zeal. What does that God say? What is God telling us about his heart for this valley? God said, have great zeal. 
Here's the word of the Lord. It came to me. Listen, just because you have a vision in a dream doesn't make it less real. God appeared to Solomon in a dream. Was it real? Solomon's answer to the Lord based on that dream changed the whole history. Of course it's real. That was the word of the Lord to our body. The same call and purpose and destiny and sovereignty of God that was on Zechariah is on this church to become his habitation. So he once encouraged him in chapter 8 by saying, I will return to Zion, verse 3, I'll dwell in her midst. Chapter 4, verse 4, old men and old women shall sit again in the streets. Verse 5, the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing. Verse 6, if it's marvelous in the eyes of the rim of this people, in these days it will also marvelous in my eyes, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, verse 7, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I'll bring them back. They shall dwell in the midst. They shall be my people. I will be their God in truth and righteousness. Verse 9, thus says the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong. You who have been hearing these days, in these days the words by the mouth of the prophets who spoke in the day the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord of hosts that the, temp that the temple might be built. Here's the word of God to all of us. We have heard what the Holy Spirit has spoken to us as a body. God said, I'm very zealous to build my habitation here. Let your hands be strong and do what we've heard. Amen. That's what it's saying. God said, in the, before there were no wages for anybody, but he said, I will not treat the remnant of this people, verse 11, like I did in the former days. Now the seed shall be prosperous. The vine will give its fruit. The ground will give its increase. I'm going to cause the remnant of this people to possess all these. I will save you. You'll be a blessing. Do not fear, he says again in verse 13. Let your hands be strong. Verse 16. These are the things you shall do. Speak each man the truth to his neighbor. Give judgment in your gates for truth and justice and peace. Let none of you think evil in your heart against your neighbor. I, I just, it's mind blowing to me how parallel this is to what we've been preaching the last four weeks. Love one another, bear with one another, forgive one another, keep the unity of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what he's saying? Why? God says, I'll dwell in your midst. Verse 20 For thus says the Lord of hosts, people shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go and continue and pray before the Lord. Let's seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will also go. Yes, many people in strong nations shall come to seek the Lord. That was my second dream. People who were coming here, I saw people come from Africa. saw people come from other parts of our nation. They were coming here. They said, We're seeking the Lord. They asked me, Can someone pray for us? Is there anyone that can prophesy? We need to hear from God. I remember telling them, Yes, there is. Come on in. So let me summarize. Let me close. I'm encouraged by this word. Amen. Glory to God. What do we do? What do we do? We must be doers and not hearers only. Amen. I don't expect that any of us would be a, a hearer only on purpose. I don't think anyone intends to do that. But it happens to us if we're not diligent. It does happen to us. We, have, we start out with good intentions, but somehow it doesn't work out. So let's not let that happen. What should we do? Number one, we must believe. What we're doing is we're pioneering something. We're pioneering something. We're recovering our inheritance. We're going to see something in Lancaster that's never been seen in our generation. That requires something of us. That requires faith. We need to have the faith that they did in the Old Testament. When they went into Moses' temple, they sanctified themselves first. We need to have that kind of faith. Now watch. If, if we would prepare ourselves all week long, as if the awesome 
manifest glory cloud of God was going to manifest next Sunday. I mean the kind of awe where you get down on your face and you're afraid to look up. The awesome presence of God where you say, this is the scariest thing I've ever experienced and the most wonderful. I hope it never ends. It's hard to put into words. If we would, if we would say, I'm going to prepare my heart for that. I want to prepare my heart every time, every day. Every day to be as clean as I can. My honest, clean, upright. My lips to be without sin. No criticism. No passing judgment. No bitterness, no gossip, no repeating things. My lips holy unto the Lord. My hands clean. My heart pure. And number one, prepare like that. Number two, come praying and expecting. See, it's, it's all faith. If you believe we're to be his dwelling place, then we should, we should do our part. We should say, Lord, read Ephesians 4. If you missed any of the last four weeks, get the CDs or go online. You can hear them all for free. I'll rehear them again. Practice what's in there. Love everybody. Forgive everybody. Do your best to pursue peace with all men and holiness. During the week, ask God for healing and deliverance from anything that's unclean. Repent of it. Put it away. And pray all week long. Say, Lord, we're supposed to be your dwelling place. Lord, we're supposed to be your habitation. I pray for your refiner's fire to be on our whole congregation. Listen, let's all pray for each other. I pray, Lord, for your refiner's fire to be on all of us this week. Purify us. Lord, I pray that you'll cleanse us and forgive us from unbelief. Listen, I'm not faulting anybody for unbelief. When they came out of Babylon, they didn't believe. They never saw the temple before. They never saw the glory. But God, God wanted them to believe what they had never seen. That's why he told them, I'll be a wall of fire around you. I'll be the glory in your midst. He said, people from many nations shall come and they'll become part of me. He said, so let your hands be strong and do it. That's what we need to do. We need to say, Lord, I, I, want to, I want us to repent from ever coming to church without hungering and expecting for, for more glory than we ever had before. I'm serious. I'm not trying to make someone feel bad. I'm trying to change our minds. Can we repent? And if we ever catch ourselves coming to church thinking, I don't expect anything. I expect eh, some anointed worship. Maybe the pastor will get riled up a little bit. Who knows? Whatever. Maybe there might be a prophecy. I'll go home. No. Repent of that. Repent of not expecting to meet God. Repent. And prepare. All week long, prepare. Lord, next week, I'm going to meet you. Because there's, now we can all meet God every day alone, but there's another dynamic that happens when the body comes together. Repent of coming to church without oil. Repent of ever going through any day without oil. Monday through Saturday. We ought to make sure that the first thing in the morning we have a good chunk of time with God. We get oil. Or whenever you do your prayer time, but make sure it happens. Get filled up. Everybody bring oil to the meeting. Oil, hunger, faith, and expectancy. Now listen, we're not wanting to be, we are not wanting to be what we've been. That's why I'm saying it like this. If this is uncomfortable for someone, it's because we need to break out of where we are. 
Let's, let's lay on our face this week and say, God, are my hands clean? Is my heart pure? I'm coming to meet God. And I'm praying for all my brothers and sisters this week for holiness, Amen. for hunger, for faith, for expectancy, and I'm coming hungry Sunday. God, meet us. Now that is how we should meet every time we meet. Midweek or Sunday. Home group or here. Home groups is the same. Let it go to the home groups, the same hunger, same preparation. Cleanse our hands. Pray. A, bring oil to the meeting. And I believe in our weakness. We may not do it perfectly, but if we'll do it wholeheartedly, God's grace will bring it to pass. Listen, God never, we may not do everything just right, but if we'll do it with all of our heart, God will bring it to pass. He said it's not by might or power, it's by his spirit. We must become the habitation of God for the sake of our valley. Because once it happens, I guarantee other congregations all over the valley will ignite on fire. And the fire will sweep through the valley. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. God is good. God is good. He's very zealous for Zion. He will dwell in her midst. He will be a wall of fire around us. The day will come, we'll see visible fire. Why would we think that's strange? They did on the day of Pentecost. God said the glory of the latter house will be greater than the former. We should have more glory than they did on Pentecost. Listen, you may not know this, but you were born for this time. You were made for this. You know how many people's youth is going to be renewed in the glory? The glory starts manifesting, people's youth will be renewed. You might live a lot longer than you thought. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, I ask for your grace to be upon all of us. Lord, help us to break out of the been there, done that, mundane, unbelief, not expect anything, not get nothing attitude. God, we repent of it. I want to throw that off like an old rag. Lord, we put on the new mind of Christ. You are building us into a holy dwelling place. Lord, we know you're going to be the glory in our midst and the fire around us. That God, people will come from many places. They're going to be healed, saved, delivered, made whole. Broken hearts healed. Broken marriages healed. Broken bodies restored. Multitudes falling in love with Jesus. Multitudes coming out of darkness and walking in the light. Thank you, O oh God. And from this place, the Lord will send out many. From this place, God will send out many who will carry fire. They'll carry anointing and fire in the word of the Lord. From this place, God will send out many. Many! Many shall go carry the fire, carrying fire. And it'll spread all over our nation. Lord, have your way in us. Lord, I ask you to break unbelief off of us. Yes, Lord. Amen. Fill us with the faith of Jesus. God, we're going to come back next week hungry, sanctified, praying, carrying oil in our vessels. Lord, give us the grace to let go of and get rid of whatever hinders our quiet time with God. Give us the grace, Lord, to reprioritize so that, Lord, once again, you are our first 
and highest priority. Have your way, Lord. 